So road trip from Havana to Vinales. So this is something that normally would take about three hours and we're gonna do it in 45 minutes with some great <coughs> stops along the way. And um, to give you an idea, um, I'm Jenny Desmond and my husband, Stephen Desmond, who's on the call. He and I started this business together five years ago. And um, after I went with the Boulder Sister City program, and um, just was super impressed by Cuba and what an extraordinary place it is. I've traveled all over Latin America and my degree is in Spanish and community development and my master's is in nonprofit. Religion. And I went to Cuba and I said, oh, I found my place. And this is one of those things that's super hard um, for Americans to go to because of <laughs> changing embargo rules. And so that's when I said to Steve, we got to do this. And um, so, so we've sent many groups, we've gone with many groups. Um, we have been to Cuba together nine times. And um, we have a couple different itineraries, but at the moment, well, at the moment, we're not running any of them, of course. Um, but when we get back to traveling, it'll be this, the itinerary that includes Vinales. Um, it does not include come away because right now um, the US government has restricted flights, commercial flights to be only in and out of Havana. So we can no longer fly in and out of come away. So we, we don't go there anymore. But things keep changing. Five years, we've done many different things. So that gives you an idea who we are. And I think we've got an idea of who you are because many of you have traveled with us before. Um, some of you were going to travel with us the end of March and we had to cancel that tour. And then um, others have been to Cuba on their own or are interested in hoping to go to Cuba someday. So not everybody has been to these places, but if you've been to them and I say the wrong thing, straighten me out. So, um, here's an overview of the island. So we will start in Havana and um, from there we go to Las Terrazas and then from there we go to Soroa and from Soroa we end in Vinales. Um, so, so on some of our tours we just do a straight drive Havana to Vinales. Um, sometimes we stop in the other two areas, but I thought this would be a fun road trip for today. Um, yeah, this gives you a close, closer look. What I like about this map is you can kind of see where the mountains are. So you can see the diversity of um, uh, land that we're gonna go through on this trip. So starting with Havana, how do you talk about Havana in five minutes? <laughs> it's impossible. Um, but some of the things to know about Havana is it's a city of 2.2 million people and Cuba is an island of 11 million people. And James Lucadden, who's on the call, is the gracious photographer who took my picture of the Moro Fortress and my picture of the Nacional Hotel and edited them to make them beautiful. <laughs> so. Jim, thank you so much, and I'm glad you're here to see your pictures. Um, yeah, so this walkway here, they call it the longest couch in, the, in Latin America, and it's the Malecon. So there's an easy place to sit, huge wide walkway, um, right along the ocean. And then you see these beautiful sunsets uh, that shine onto the Moro Fortress which was built in the 16 and 1700s. Um, and it's really built to conform with the size of the land. And uh, every night at nine o'clock, the way we have eight o'clock howls in Colorado during pandemic time, at nine o'clock, 365 days a year in Cuba, they um, fire off the cannon from the fortress. And that is to announce that the city gates are closing. And this is a tradition that came from the 16, 1700s. So it's a pretty stunning fortress. Oops. And then down here, we've got the um, 
Alicia Alonso National Theater. And uh, on occasion, on some of our tours, we've been able to buy tickets to go see ballet or dance, folk, folkloric dance performances in this stunning, stunning building. Hmm. Um, and it's, uh, it's one of my favorites. And then we've got the Hotel Nacional. And no trip to Havana is complete without stepping into the lobby, maybe buying yourself a Cuba Libre there and um, looking through, they have a, a small gallery of photos of famous people that have been to the Nacional. And it was built by mafia mobsters in the 1930s and 40s. And uh, so it has a rich, <laughs> casino tradition that ended when Castro came in. Um, this gives you a, a moment to uh, kind of see what the malecon is like when the sun is setting. Not a lot of car horns and a variety of cars. You know, it was predicted that this area would be um, totally transformed because it's right on the water. So these people are walking on the Malecon and the ocean is off to the left of your screen. And um, they predicted this would be completely transformed. And in the five years we've been going, we've seen one modern hotel built up along the Malecon. And the others, yeah, a little bit of renovations happen here and there. We have a really special restaurant we like to eat at for a welcome dinner um, called San Cristobal along here. Um, that gives you an idea of what that's like. People in the city. So people of Cuba come from all different backgrounds. And so um, like this woman, she she's probably of Spanish descent. She's got lighter skin, blonde hair, and blue eyes. And then there's uh, somewhere between forty to eighty percent of Cubans have African descendancy. And then there's the there's people that are mixed. What's interesting is um, at my my other job, I work for a nonprofit in Boulder County, Colorado, and we teach English to immigrants. And so, of course, in Colorado, we have a lot of immigrants from Mexico, but we truly have immigrants from all over Latin America. But when the Caribbean ones come in to take classes, you can, I can tell right away. <laughs> and uh, it's always like, eres del Caribe? <laughs> Puede ser? Oh, sí, sí, soy cubano. Ah, por eso. So it's always a delight when I get to meet a Cuban taking English classes at Intercambio. So there's a variety of people in the cities and a variety of talent. But I, the, here's our special guest appearance for tonight. So um, you may know one of our guides, Roger. And uh, his, he lives in Kamaway, Cuba, and his internet is not fast enough for him to be able to participate in a Zoom call. We talked about it. So um, he's going to give you a little welcome, and then um, uh, later on, we'll have him tell us a little bit about the Soroa Orchid Gardens. Hello, everyone. Very glad to I can contact you today. Jenny told me that you were going to meet up, and I said, oh, well, I have to at least send my best regards to all of the ones I just had the very nice opportunity to meet and enjoy their company. <laughs> for the ones who don't know me, I'm Roger. I just lead tours for Jenny in Cuba. And I'm sorry if you see me wearing this kind of camouflage now, but I'm just like almost ready to go out into the jungle as soon as possible and start taking all my bird photos and maybe getting after a little bit of a, a snake or two. Thank you very much <laughs> for enjoying some time with us here. And uh, I hope you'll be back soon. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> Did that bring back memories, anybody? <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Def definitely does. I have to jump back so I can see you all for a minute. Um, let's see, stop, share. 
So did you want to wave hello to him and <laughs> disappointed that it was a recording? <laughs> yeah, 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 being part of the last trip down there, we got a chance to meet him in person and he is uh, just an amazing guide. His knowledge, his personality, his he's a birder, his photography, and he has about 6,000 stories you're going to hear during a, any trip that he's going to be guiding you through. So he's an amazing guy. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. You know, fantastic guide. Really, you know, so much energy and, and so much knowledge. We went the other way out of Havana, although the Vanalis is the way I wanted to go. But as we were heading the other way, Roger stopped and went shopping. And when he got on the bus, we all asked him what he bought. And he said toilet paper because he can't get it in his hometown. So if we think the toilet paper shortage was here, he had to buy it on our tour at one of the stops. And he lives in the third largest city in the country. So it tells you a lot about the, the struggle with distribution. But I think we are all having this common experience now of going to the grocery store and thinking, wow, there's no chicken today, but this is what it is in Cuba for lots of things all the time. Let's go back to Havana. I had one other thing I wanted to show you before we get on the bus and head out of town. Okay, so atypical artwork. I didn't know, I had a hard time picking what to focus on for Cuba, but um, I, I love the street art that you see in Havana. Um, so this obviously is a mural done in shades of gray on a building that is faded and grayed on its own. Um, this one, I just took this picture in November and it is right outside of Chinatown. So if you've never been to Havana, it might surprise you to know that it has about four blocks that are Chinatown. And that is from the um, immigration of people from the East, primarily China in the 1860s and 70s. And they came over as indentured slaves because there was a famine happening in China at that time. So that's, that's right outside the gates of Chinatown. And then this one I uh, saw last summer I, when we were there in July and took that picture. And I just think that um, she's part of the stunning beauty of Cuban women and very representative of the stunning beauty there. Okay, so let's get on the bus. And um, actually, would anybody like to add anything special about Havana before we head to Las Terrazas? I just wanted to add how walkable Havana is and how safe it is to even walk at night. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a maze, as you can see in the, on the map. Um, but yeah, getting around, it is, and it's super safe. Steve likes to say, Steve and Desmond, my husband, who is the Longmont police detective, he likes to say that Havana is safer than Longmont. Because uh, if you leave your wallet in the back of a cab in Havana, and this has happened to us twice, not me, <laughs> to two of our guests, um, the next morning, the cab driver both times came back to that same casa and said, somebody left their wallet in my cab and it had all of their money in it still. And then there have been other times where we've been out at three and four in the morning, um, walking the streets of Havana and it's, it's dark because they don't use a lot of street lights in Havana, um, but unusually safe for Latin America. Yeah, Maggie and Charlie can testify because they stayed out really late with us sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's the whole point of going to Cuba, isn't it? Enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so we're going to hop on the highway and we're going to head down oh, about an hour outside the city into the beginning of the mountains to Las Terrazas. And, um, Las Terrazas is a pretty special place. So um, Las Terrazas is an eco park that was uh, established hmm, before the revolution in 1959. 
And, um, it, you know, it's really kind of like going to Estes Park for people who live in Longmont. You know, it's a great escape. It's an hour's drive away. And so only about half of the people that go there are foreigners because it's a well-hidden secret. The rest of them are Cubans. And in 1985, it was established as a UNESCO um, ecological site and a biosphere. And so um, they established it and so they have it protected. And uh, Cuba recognized in the 70s and 80s how much deforestation was happening around the country. And if you've been to Puerto Rico, you've seen some of the effects of deforestation. And um, so um, between the 70s and 80s, they planted over 7 million trees in this area. And Las Terrazas means the terraces. So they had terraced farming there before. And so um, in the, at the end of the 1700s, the French were, the French coffee plantation owners were fleeing Haiti because of the slavery uprising. And many of them came here and began to grow coffee. And so they would, then they were, you can see when you go to Las Terrazas, you can see the uh, areas laid out where um, they would lay the coffee out to dry. Now there are a few coffee trees left, but not much in this area. Most of the coffee farming happens around Trinidad and in the middle, south middle of the island. Um, so this is a great place to swim in the lake, um, to stay for a few days. So there are, there are people that live there that work in ecology, that work um, in, their, in tourism, and they do guides or guiding around the park. They have a little hotel that people can stay at. Um, what's interesting is you know you've left the city because the mosquitoes start biting you when you go to Las Terrazas. <laughs> so in Havana, there's a lot of fumigation, not many mosquitoes. But you go to Las Terrazas and the Cubans there that live in Las Terrazas are wearing long sleeves and long pants all the time, no matter what the weather, so that they don't get eaten by mosquitoes. So it's a very natural nature park. Um, sorry, Steve, my husband, that I didn't have a picture of you to put right here <laughs> in the river. <laughs> um, but there's a great river for wading in and, um, and then this is the national bird of Cuba, which is the Cuban trogon. Notice the colors match the Cuban flag, red, white, and blue. And when the trogon chirps, it spreads its tail feathers apart. So you can see the stripes. Um, we often see them in this area and then um, by Trinidad. And I, they're stunning. I never get tired of seeing them. And I would describe them as being just a little bit larger than a robin. Um, and it's, yeah, it's part of the trogon family. And this is the only place in the world where these, the Cuban trogons live, the tocororos. I hope you enjoyed your lunch and live music at Las Terrazas. And we're gonna head to Soroa, the botanical gardens. And the Soroa botanical gardens are incredible because there are over 6,000 um, plant, plant species in these botanical gardens and um, over six, 700 kinds of orchids that grow here. So they're well cultivated, um, beautiful, stunning. And you even have these fields of orchids that you walk through. And uh, you know, orchids oftentimes they're, what do they call them, biomes? So they will, they will establish themselves on the side of a tree and grow there. And there's this beautiful bridge. This is a, um, an area, it's over 500 acres and it was established in the 1940s um, by a man who came from Spain and um, fell in love with this area and grew, and after his wife passed away, he started growing these orchids in her honor. So when he um, 
he left the island in 1960. And so then this became uh, a national, national state park of Cuba. So it's well preserved and it's gorgeous. So this is, these are some of the things you see in the daytime. Um, and you see the Cuban toady, which this is one of Roger's photos. This Cuban toady is the size of a sparrow. They're very little. Um, and it was just in July was the first time that I had ever seen one. Um, and they live no other place in the world. They're endemic to Cuba. And our trip in July was a, um, it was a biology trip. And so we took down uh, reptile and amphibian fans to uh, Cuba and we hired, you know, Roger helped lead the tour and then we also hired Tomas, a um, biologist and he's actually a scorpion specialist in Cuba um, to go out with us. And the, um, the snakes are most active in Cuba at night, in the heat of the summer, towards the beginning of the rainy season. And so we, went, we would go into the forest every night with our flashlights looking for snakes. It was delightful. <laughs> Only because we know that there are no poisonous snakes in Cuba. And so you can see our shirts are all drenched and that's from sweat. So we, um, on this night, in this area around Saroa, we found a Cuban boa constrictor. And as soon as Tomas picked it up and he's holding it by its head right here, um, because it bit the first guy who picked it up, <laughs> one of the biologists in our group, who was just so proud to get a snake bite on this trip. Um, Tomas took it, held it by its head, and the boa proceeded to wrap itself around Tomas's arm, because it's a constrictor. So there's some pretty fascinating stuff. Let me promise you, in nine trips to Cuba, only two other times have seen little itty bitty snakes. So we found them because we were searching for them and we were there in the heat of the summer. And the other things that we live in that area are, is the Cuban night and Noel. You can see him here and um, this is a tree branch that we found him on. You see him right here. So he turns white, gray and white at night to sleep so he can blend in with the branches so no predators find him. But then we woke him up <laughs> and um, got to see you know, these, these fascinating creatures. So there's good wildlife in Cuba. Oh. Now we're to Vinales. Bam, we're making good time on this road trip. 7.45. Okay, so many of you have been to Vinales before. And Vinales is one of my favorite places in Cuba. The views are stunning. So they describe it like South China in that it has these pin cushion limestone mountains. And then the, because they're limestone, they're filled with caves. Uh, so there are just caves everywhere. In fact, there's one spot where there's a river that goes through the cave. And there have been two different trips where we've been able to take a riverboat cruise through the cave. Through the cave. So it's pretty fascinating. Um, but life is simple in Vinales. Not a lot of tractors, um, but a lot of farmers. And this is one of the bread baskets of Cuba where they do amazing farming. And so um, that's what's happening here is he's bringing in um, more dirt to uh, do renovation on a house. And Vinales in the five years that we've been going to Cuba has changed a ton. So when we first went there, the very first time we went there, we stayed in a hotel. And um, <laughs> Jim Luke Adam can tell you about this one. Hey, Jim, can you unmute yourself and tell us about the hotel above Vinales? Do you remember anything about the toilets there? Well, there weren't any uh, toilet seats. Um, we were lucky we had toilet sleep seats, but no hot water. Yeah. Yeah. 
I have to confess that that was the last trip where we stayed in hotels <laughs> because it was so disappointing, um, the quality of service and the accommodations. So now we only stay in bed and breakfast and um, Vinales, you know, the first time we went five years ago, they would have a couple Casa Particulares, the bed and breakfast on each street and it's a small, small town probably 6,000 people total. And that includes the farms around it. Um, and then the last time we were there was in July and almost every single house was a Casa Particular. So the Cuban government invested in helping people um, set up their house to be a bed and breakfast and in addition to that, this is another UNESCO World Heritage Site. The whole valley is. And so they get extra funding and extra incentive um, for the government to really invest in this area. So let's go have dinner at um, one of the organic farms that overlooks the valley. Uh, so you'll see that they've, they have really perfected um, lining your garden up just right, doing raised beds. Um, one of the things, because Cuba went through such a hardship in the 90s, they call it the special period, but it's a time when Cubans were really starving due to the collapse of the Soviet Union. And so um, without all of that petroleum, it's hard to make fertilizer. And without the money to purchase fertilizer, um, they started making, they got experts at making their own. So most food that you buy in Cuba, if it was grown in Cuba, it's organic because they continue to utilize that today. Um, I wish my lettuce were this big right now, <laughs> but at least I have some coming up from the soil. So this is one of the beautiful places that we like to go eat. And this farm, not only does it provide food for this restaurant, that overlooks the farm. You can see a little bit right along here of the, um, the, the places where they're growing vegetables. But um, they have two other restaurants, one in the town of Vinales and then another one in Havana that they provide all of the food for. So it's a really special place, wonderful place um, at night or at sunset to watch the sun go down. Um, and then of course, cigar plantations. So um, one of the, you can't go to Vinales particularly, which is the heart of, of tobacco growing in Cuba without learning about how tobacco is grown, harvested and um, processed. Um, so these gentlemen, you can see, have cut their um, leaves and tied them up and now they're taking them into a drying barn where the tobacco leaves will dry. And tobacco leaves are very tender, so they have to be um, cautious. They have to work carefully with them in contrast to sugar, can, like sugar cane, which you chop down with machetes. Um, and so this is one of our um, friends who is a farmer there in Vinales that we always go visit. And um, he shows us how they um, process, or how they dry the leaves and then roll them into cigars. So sometimes you can even buy cigars there. Um, would anybody like to share about, uh, uh, something about Vinales, if you've been here? I was hoping you were going to have a picture of the woman from that tobacco farm who had a huge stogie she was puffing on, and she is she is the most vivid image I have of Cuba, is this old woman smoking this big fat cigar. So I was mm -hmm. hoping you had a picture of her, but she's not there. She's not here. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, yeah. She's She's pretty spectacular. It's always amazing to me. I think, wow, how, are the, how do these people live so long when they spend their whole lives smoking tobacco? But then again, I never ask them, how old are they? I make the assumption 
of how old they are, but they're probably younger and have aged quicker than we do in Colorado because of the hard work. Okay, so thanks for taking a road trip with us. I had a couple group photos I wanted to drop in. Maybe you'll see yourself in one of them. Marty, Cindy, Maggie. Yeah. Carly, Karen and Jim. So next time, go to Cuba with us. The handful of you that I have never met before. I hope that you'll consider going with us sometime. Check out our website. Um, and uh, yeah, come explore Cuba with us. Well, I guess I'd, I'd, I'd have, like to make a comment. Um, you know, Cuba is obviously a fascinating place to go visit, but the, the, the quality of the tour is, is just amazing. The, mm -hmm. the care, you know, Roger is a guy, a uh, wonderful bus you're traveling in with a uh, personal driver as well. And the whole experience, you're so so well taken care of. It's so so well put together. It's so organized. Mm -hmm. Who else? So I, I have a question, uh, Jenny. Yeah. As, as the COVID came to the island and we were there for the final days of that, you could see particularly our, our bus drivers and, and Ray and all the other people that supported us, you could see their life was just drying up and they, they could see it coming, we could see it coming, they lived on tourism. So what do you hear from them? How are they getting along? How are they managing? What do you hear from the island uh, in this last month or so? For the first four weeks, I know when we here in the States started locking down, uh, Roger was messaging Steve and I a couple times a week to see if we were okay because they were hearing such scary news out of the US. So I really felt, I, I wanted to message him and say, it's okay, we're not gonna die. <laughs> Steve and I don't, don't have a plan to die. Um, and, but I could tell that he was really fearful for all of us in the US because the numbers are so much higher here. Um, even, I mean, I looked at the number today. It is the state of Colorado, the cases and the deaths is astronomically higher than all of Cuba. And we have half the population. Um, but you're right, John, they, that um, this is a cash economy where people um, hustle to get by and to have a good life. And the hustle has stopped for a lot, well, for everybody who works in tourism. And so they're kind of holding their breath, waiting for things to change. One good thing is that this is coming as the summer is coming and tourism really drops off in the summertime in Cuba because it is so hot. And then you get into August and September and you, you hit the rainy season another time when they don't get a lot of tourists. So that is the good thing is that hopefully they'll be able to ramp up full force by October in Cuba. But obviously here in the US, we have no idea when we're gonna be able to travel again. Um, and uh, I did, if you, uh, some of you have had the driver Rainier, who, um, he has a little girl that's just turned one year old. And <clears throat> he, he messaged me this week and he said, um, in Cuba, there is no public transportation right now because they want every Cuban to stay at home. And uh, so he is driving for electricians uh, to a spot 80 kilometers outside of his town um, where they're doing construction work. So he sent me a picture and he had his mask on and his hat and he said every day he comes home and um, when he, before he enters the house, he changes his shoes and then he has to clean the bottom of his shoes with chlorine before he can wear them in the house. So there's some areas where they're much more conscientious 
about germs than we are here. Um, although I'm sure that some of you, especially those of you who are biologists or work in the medical profession, Sandy and Connie, you're probably taking very cautious measures about what enters your house and what could have been exposed compared to the average Coloradoan. So. Yeah, so they're, they're waiting and hoping that the surge returns. They're also uh, anxious to see if Trump is our president for four more years. Right? So when Trump came to power, he made it very difficult um, or more difficult for Americans to go to Cuba. And so they're anxious. The ones who work in tourism are anxiously hoping that Trump does not get reelected. So that tourism can grow. Uh, all the all the guides and all the bus drivers were just great, great guys. You know, I just uh, my heart goes out to them. They were just we loved them all. Jenny, That's wonderful. Yeah, Marty. Um, I have a question about the medical profession. Are they making any advances on the COVID virus? They are good, <laughs> actually. Good. Yeah. You know, what's ironic is we've heard a little bit about um, chloroquine and those anti-malarials being yeah. helpful, right? Well, I mean, that's something they use all the time in Cuba and they've been using for 40 years. So um, it's not an unusual drug for them to work with. And um, they have been, I've been reading articles about Cubans and Chinese researchers working together to find yeah the vaccine to find the antidote. The issues regarding um, what's required to travel, I mean, you can again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and so before I talk about visas real quick, um, uh, just to add to that, if you, if you are not somebody who I know, if you and I have never emailed, if you want to drop your email into the chat box, and just send it to me. So you look down and you find my name, send it to me. Then I will send you, um, and I'll send the rest of you who I do have your email, this amazing moving commercial that Roger sent to me yesterday. It's a poem in Spanish, but uh, even if you don't understand the words, it speaks volumes. And it is um, called, it's called, I'll love you from a distance. And so these Cuban poets are reciting this poetry and you see these photo clips um, of people in masks and Havana without a single car moving in the streets because everybody's in lockdown. And, um, and there's a little clip in there of um, the Cuban doctors arriving in Torino, Italy to help out the Italians. So uh, it's really moving. I'll email it to you. But yeah, send me send me your email in the chat box if you're somebody who I don't have your email. Okay, Barbara. So to, there are 12 ways to travel to Cuba. And it's our 12 visas you can travel under. And there are things like a religious visa, a, um, uh, wow. Education. Uh, Education, thank you, <laughs> science. <laughs> yeah, very specific things, music. Um, and so we travel under the visa that is support for the Cuban people. And so that is that involves staying in Casa Particulares because those are run by entrepreneurs rather than the Cuban government. Um, and we try to eat in Paladares, which are um, home-run restaurants rather than government-owned restaurants. And uh, we have a, have a full itinerary every day. And those are all rules that have been put together by the American government um, that we have to follow. And so we have figured out how to bend our business every time they make a change in the law. We used to travel on educational people to people tours and then Trump did away with that. Um, so that's, that's the benefit of being a small business as we can adapt. Um, and then our business, we take care of getting the visas and everything for you. So you don't have to sweat any of it. Well, everybody, I hope you enjoyed your mojito. I hope <laughs> you enjoyed the road trip. Um, and so if you, if you wanna take off, take off. 
um, the bus is parked here. <laughs> and then I would like to have private conversations with all 30 of you. <laughs> I don't know how to make that happen. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. You're great as always. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you.